wires. I can appreciate the fact of hardware. Everyone, welcome to day two of FOC. My name is Sean Cross, and I'm going to spend the next hour or so talking about the Novena open source laptop. Uh, a little bit about what we're going to go over. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about, I'm going to give some background on myself and on the Novena project itself. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, how both hardware and software can evolve. I'm going to talk about how the community helped us put this, this laptop together. I'm going to talk about some of the decisions that we made when we built this laptop. Some of them are kind of unorthodox, and I'm going to explain why we made those decisions. I'm going to talk about what we needed to do on our own to build this that the community was not able to help us do. And I'm going to talk about how the community and everyone here can help us in the future and help other open hardware projects as well. start a little bit about me. I'm going to skip most of the early history. I'm going to go about seven years ago. I joined a company called Chumbi. Chumbi made these two devices, among other things. It's basically a smart digital alarm clock that, among other things, runs Linux. And when I first joined Chumbi, we had just released the Chumbi Classic, which is on the, the left right there, and I joined as a QA. Um, we were working on a cost-reduced version, and there was nobody else available, so I took it upon myself and learned how to do kernel development. And three or four months later, we did the product on the right called the Chumbi One. Now, the thing about Chumbi is it was a consumer product, which means we did a lot of manufacturing in China, which introduced me to living in China, it introduced me to how manufacturing works, sourcing, all that other stuff. The person who did the hardware, most of the hardware design, is this guy, with the name of Bunny. He is known for a, a bunch of things from hacking the Xbox to designing Chumbi. He really showed me how this all worked. He showed me how the Chinese manufacturing chain works. He showed me how to do this hardware design. Um, and he helped me form Kosagi, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Uh, the thing is, we do manufacturing in China, and because of that, Xiaomi wanted a base in Asia. And eventually, they ended up moving us to Singapore, which is great, they speak English. They are in Asia, and more importantly, they're only four hours away from China. Now, when you're in the US or Europe, when you want to go to China, it's a 12 to 20 hour flight, and you have to go through at least two borders. Um, you're going to fly into Hong Kong and then cross the border into China. And at least from the US, it's a 15 hour time zone change. So if you need to make a factory run, it's going to take at least a week, just in terms of uh, overhead, in terms of flying there, the time zone change, immigration, coming back. So by living in Singapore, if you need to make a factory visit, it's only four hours. So Chumbi opened up Chumbi Singapore, and eventually they went out of business. But Buddy and I were enjoying it so much that we came up with a company called Fosagi. So of course, being Japanese for small rabbit. On the little joke there. We did a couple of products, which I show here. The NETV there on the right. Uh, the reason why I did that actually has a Chumbi logo on the top because we did that when we were still with Chumbi. It uses an FPGA and has a built-in Linux machine that overlays graphics in real time on top of an encrypted HDMI stream that works entirely in the encrypted domain. We took that. We put in the Coban board, which is up there on the left. And we use that to act as a robotic controller board. And we sold this to universities and high school students who compete in a project called Botball. And the thing these two have in common is they both have FPGAs. And we love FPGAs. You can do so many cool things with FPGAs. We use them a lot of times for race engineering. For, um, we've done things where uh, we actually use the NETV, hooked it up to HDMI cables, and we were emulating man flash. Uh, as kind of another thing, one of the other things we do is in the middle there called circuit stickers. It's where we take actual adhesive stickers and put LEDs on them, and you can use them to show basic electronics to kids. You can stick them in a greeting card and then lights up. And everyone loves blinky lights. We had done enough with the FPGAs that we decided we needed to build a brand new platform. And when we took a look at what we could do, we ended up designing this board, the Novena. It started out as a Tor open router, which is why it has some unusual features like dual Ethernet. 
Um, and we also put an FPGA, FPGA on there so that we can take advantage of a lot of the um, interesting things we're doing with reverse engineering and hardware. One of the first projects we did was reverse, reverse engineered uh, an SD card. The way SD cards work is it's a block and flash, the SD interface, and in between is actually a microcontroller. And using the FPGA, we were able to emulate the NAND flash and then figure out how the microcontroller works. And we actually presented last December in Germany at CCC. We had presented on Novena, and people came up with us. They said, that's a really cool laptop. At the time, it looked like this, uh, which it looks really cool. But let me tell you, it's really difficult to get through airport security. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's an open laptop. You can clearly see that there's nothing explosive in there. Uh, um, the original laptop was actually used book binding techniques. Uh, it's three pieces of aluminum or aluminum, depending on where you're from, uh, with a sheet of aluminum for the keyboard tray. And then we 3D printed things like the palm rest and the speaker box. Uh, and we just bolted it all together. The LCD was just bolted onto the front of the screen. Actually, interestingly enough, what the TSA really didn't like was we had a battery that was a radio-controlled battery that wasn't straight, it was at an angle. And they didn't like the fact that there was a battery at an angle. They always called out and always wanted to inspect it. But uh, in a move of class, we actually went to the Hong Kong textile markets and we uh, clad these in suede. Uh, it's actually green leather on the front. It's, it's real leather, uh, which was kind of a nice touch of class, I thought. Uh, but enough people were interested in it that they convinced us that we wanted to do a crowd campaign. And so in May of this year, we did a crowd supply campaign where we, we wanted $250,000 and we ended up grossing $721,000. So this thing's getting built. Uh, you can see that the design of this is different from the earlier model. We realized that there were a few problems with this, aside from the TSA aspect. Um, one of the aspects is that it is an open laptop, which means you're going to be one fiddling, you're going to be wanting to fiddle with the inside. And with a traditional laptop, that's really difficult to do because there's a keyboard in the way. I mean, anyone who's ever tried to repair your home laptop, it's, there's a lot of screws, a lot of things that go missing, and just getting access to the main board can be a challenge. But by opening it up like this, that's the clamshell design like this, that means you can access the inside pretty easily. And one of the things we realized when we went to go design a laptop is that they're really complicated. Here's the original NET, that first thing I told you that we did at the very beginning. It's power input schematic, the symbols that it looks like that defines which wires go where, that go from the wall to the NET itself, it looks like this. It's a USB connector, so it takes five volts in, and it does a little bit of regulation, and it basically spits five volts out. Just make sure it's a nice, clean five volts. It's not too terribly complicated. The Coban board that we did next is a little bit more complicated. It supports a single two-cell battery that it can charge, and its input schematic looks like this. So this is both the input that it takes from the wall, which it lives about nine volts. It'll regulate that down, it'll feed that into the battery, and it'll run the main board. Now, Wina is a little bit more complicated than that. Its input schematic looks like this. So that's taking in anywhere from 7 volts to about 20. It regulates it down. There's an under voltage lockout protection that um, makes sure that you're feeding it enough current. There is a 3.3 volt rail in addition to the 5 volt rail. So, I mean, already that's a little bit complicated. But because it's a laptop, each subsystem also has a power switch that looks like this. This one happens to be the power switch for the audio chip, so you can turn it off when, you're, when you don't need it. There's also a power chip, uh, a switch for the video. There's a switch for the serial ATA. There's a lot of different switches that when you're not using that subsystem, you just power it down. In addition, it also has a battery charger. So this is this was in on that program board. This charges anywhere from uh, two cell, three cell, four cell. It'll do lithium ion. Let us do whatever you want. In addition, there's also a gas gauge that tells you 
how full is the battery, how much is it discharging, how much time do you have left. A lot of other charging systems just measure the voltage, which doesn't really work because as you use it, the voltage will improve. As you draw less current, the voltage will go up. So you can't measure the voltage, you need to actually count the number of electrons that go in and out. In addition, we also have a full STM32 machine on here. It's, a, it's another arm controller that just manages the battery <coughs> power. And this is a lot of stuff. This is just for the battery. Laptops are hard. And we couldn't have done it all on our own. We couldn't have done it without the support of the community. The most obvious thing that we use, of course, is Linux. When Linux started out as a hobby in 1991, it was kind of, sort of, almost, uh, well, it started out as a serial emulator that happened to be multi-threaded and then eventually turned into a Minix clone and then it turned into sort of a POSIX clone. But it runs everywhere now. It runs everywhere from S3 and mainframes down into mobile phones. Um, Linux is great because it, well, it's a Fedora conference. Of course, we all know Linux is great, right? When Linux first did his kernel needed some software to run, and of course he couldn't have done it without the new software. He needed a shell to run, he got bash, he needed a compiler, he got GCC. Um, GCC is interesting in that it's not an isolated environment on its own, it has also grown and forked. There's a whole GCC EGCS split around 3.0, or merge around 3.0. So, as an example, new software can also fork and merge and, and generally get better. And of course, when he needed a graphical environment, he used X, which, and there's lots of talks about how Wayland is coming, but X turns 30 this year, and it's still with us. It's not dead yet. Uh, as, as a point of interest, X also forked, with the X sort of getting away from the X3 to 6 people. So uh, it forked, and I think it's better off for it now. Another point, distros can also fork. This is a Fedora conference. Fedora was a fork from uh, uh, that had Enterprise Linux, and then Fedora has been forked as well. Um, it's actually a really cool graph. It's something like 4,000 pixels tall, so you need a really tall screen for this. But hardware is not different. Is not that different. Hardware can also fork and evolve. This is an Arduino, it's a little 8-bit microcontroller that you can get at Radio Shack or any place like that. It has a well-defined set of input-output bits. And people have taken that. Originally, it was designed for basic serial input-output, or maybe you can turn pin on and off. But it has just proliferated in terms of what you can do with it. Uh, here's just six boards that I found that happen to all point in the same direction. Um, it's an 8-bit microcontroller. I mean, you've got Ethernet. There's an Ethernet shield number six. It's got a motor controller board, which is similar to the one that we did, the Copan board, but it's, it's an Arduino. It's, it's, it's an 8-bit microcontroller. Um, it's got a data logger. All of these people have taken the project and they've moved forward, and the community has made it better. When the Raspberry Pi came out, similar things have happened. These are just four, I think they call them plates or shields, similar tapes, I've heard of them as well. Uh, number one is just a uh, RFID uh, shield, there's a GPS module, there's uh, GPIO breakouts, hardware can fork and evolve just like software. And when Novita started, we decided to do the same thing. This is a shot of the original provision A of Novita. We thought, Raspberry Pi, that's pretty cool. Let's clone the Raspberry Pi header. Let's make it so that you can have everything that runs on a Raspberry Pi run in over Novita, but a lot faster. We also took, cloned our own design. We actually took the original Coban board and we cut the motor controller pins in half and rotated them 45 or 90 degrees and put those on the board. Um, but we eventually decided that it's not that flexible. Because the Raspberry Pi headers are 0.1 inch, they're not very good for high speed. You couldn't, for example, do an HDMI on You could clone an MTV on here. So eventually we replaced it with this high speed connector right here. Uh, on the left is what it looks like on the main board, and the right is what one of the add-on cards could look like. Which brings us, brings me to the first unusual feature that this board has, and that's it has an FPGA. Now, an FPGA is just a block of reconfigurable silicon that you can use to basically turn it into whatever you want. On the left there is just a GPIO board. It's just a series of pins that you can turn on and off from the main board. 
This is actually in use in the circuit stickers factory to program circuit stickers themselves and test the drive the pins high and low. Um, the next picture with the giant pan is just is the NAND flash emulator that we used. Uh, in the middle is a software-defined radio, and that's particularly interesting because it turns out that there's a company called Miriara that used the exact same FPGA we did with the exact same connector, but with just a slightly different pinout. And so when they heard that we were doing the Novena laptop, we they said, oh, we'll just, we could spin a new board for you. Minimum order quantity 300. And so we got that back from the community. Now there is a software-defined radio that Novena supports. And on the right there is just an oscilloscope that we did. It is a bunch of analog to digital controllers that belong to the memory that is exclusively dedicated to the FPGA. Uh, another unusual feature that we have is uh, an on-the-go on port, a USB on-the-go port. Your phone has a USB port. You plug it into your PC, you copy files to it, you unplug it, it's good to go. Most desktops and laptops don't have an on-the-go port, but I think it's, it's really useful to have. The first one on that, number one, is called an ISO stick. What you can do is you load an ISO, for example, a distro on there, and you flip the switch, and then you plug it into another PC, and it boots off of a virtual CD-ROM drive. That's great, no more burning of CDs, no more finding that arcane USB CD-ROM drive. With an on-the-go port on the laptop, you can actually boot a PC off of this machine. There's a module called G underscore file underscore system, and I'm sorry, G mesh storage. And you can load an ISO file as a virtual file system and have this emulate a, a, a CD-ROM drive. In the middle there is a, a USB Ethernet device. And I know a lot of people here have ThinkPads. Um, the newer generation of laptops don't have Ethernet ports anymore. So if you want to connect two machines together, you either have to come up with a Wi-Fi access point, or you have to get a USB Ethernet device. But with an on-the-go port, what you do is you configure this as a USB Ethernet device, and then you just plug the two together. The same cable you use to charge your mobile phone is now a network cable that you can use to do crossover. And the third element item on there is called a PS3 key. It is a device that was used to jailbreak a PlayStation 3. And that was just done with a uh, corrupt um, USB header, a corrupt USB identification header. And with an on-go port, you can do some interesting hacking and reverse engineering like that. Uh, another interesting feature that I'm just going to briefly touch on is the dual Ethernet. This has two Ethernet ports. It has a gigabit port and a 100 megabit port. And that comes from the original lineage, where this was originally going to be a Tor router. Uh, you can actually see in that picture the Tor purple that is on the router cover there. Uh, it's kind of a nice feature that you can have. For example, if you're at a LAN party and you don't want to be that guy who plugs in the, who takes up a part of the Ethernet port, you just turn it into a bridge and you're good to go. Uh, coming out of the Tor project is another unusual feature that we have, and that is that we are blob free. A blob is like a firmware driver, it usually lives, lives in slash lib slash firmware. Most Wi-Fi cards need a blob. The Wi-Fi card that we picked for this, the ATH9K, does not need a, wi a blob at all. So in order to get this on the network, no blobs whatsoever. With a small little asterisk. And I've called out on here the five places where a blob may or may not be required, depending on your definition of blob. The first one is the DMA engine. DMA is a thing that lets you copy memory from one area of the computer to another. It can be incredibly complicated. For example, DMA from the serial port to an area of memory every time there, there is a packet available, or DMA from network. So they actually have a Turing complete uh, DMA engine, yeah, it's a DSP, that has its own bytecode. But you don't actually need a blog in order to use that. You don't need to use DMA at all. And the bytecode is actually well known. There's a disassembler, there's an assembler. So is that a blog? I don't know. There's also a boot ROM on here, but then again, every chip in existence has a boot ROM. Even x86 chips have microcode that they run before it executes address zero. Um, and it's memory map, so you can actually pull it out and disassemble it. So uh, I don't know if that counts as a ROM. Uh, there are 2D and 3D graphics cores on here that require drivers, but the community has reverse engineered that, and they are really close now to getting accelerated X and Wayland. They can already play Quake. 
Um, and there's also a video core on here. So if you want to do hardware celebrated VT8 decoding, if you want to do MP4, you need a firmware log for that. But the, uh, the um, chip itself, the DSP itself, is well documented. Freescale will tell you how to get everything from the program counters to the different threads. Uh, and uh, the, it's actually being merged with the kernel. So the kernel drivers and the GStreamer drivers are all being merged upstream by the community. <coughs> Which leads us to kind of a tough question. What is a blob? Um, it's, this is more of a philosophical question. I know the Free Software Foundation has interesting definitions here. Um, this is an example of the Xilinx uh, ISC FPGA development environment. The FPGA that we have on here takes what's called a bit stream. And a bit stream is a description of how the gates on the field programmable gate array, the FPGA, are going to look. And you define it on the right there in either VHDL or Verilog. And what it spits out, uh, listed on the left, is a series of gates. You can see that, that uh, the highlighted thing on the left is muxes. Um, the file that it spits out, is that a blob? And you, you know what source code went into it. You know that the tool synthesized this. Is it still considered closed source if I give you the source code, but you need to get a proprietary tool to build it? Some people say yes, some people say no. It's kind of something to chew on. But the FPJ, you can't synthesize without using closed source tools, but you can simulate. And because hardware is hard, simulation is a really important tool. And this is an example of me simulating a um, this is a, an LED controller that I was actually running the simulation on Novena. You can synthesize, you can compile very low code on ARM Linux using open source tools, and then you can actually run the simulation using open source tools. So you can simulate and develop on Novena itself, and then when you actually want to synthesize the beat stream, you copy it to an x86 machine and actually assemble it there. So, Frequently asked questions, we, we have people who come up to us and ask, well, why did you do this? The first question we get is, why are you using ARM? And the answer there is, well, it's going to be like ARM. And it, it Chumby, the original Chumby ran ARM. Uh, in the middle there, I just have a Samsung phone because all the phones, with the exception of some Intel oddballs, run ARM. In fact, I'd say there are probably three or 400 ARM cores just in this room alone in the various laptop Wi-Fi chips and the phones, multiple phones, all the GSM radios have an ARM in them. They're just everywhere. And when you develop, you normally need a cross-compiler, but if you're writing ARM already, normal GCC works. On the right there, I have, uh, it's a decap that took the plastic off the top of a micro SD card. And you can see the flash memory in there, but I called out in the red box, there's actually an ARM chip on this micro SD controller. It's an ARM 7. Just shows there's the alarm chips are everywhere. And people have come up to us and they go, well, why not just use a Raspberry Pi? It is possible to turn a Raspberry Pi into a laptop. And the answer there is they're not very fast. They're a couple of generations behind. They don't have that much memory. Uh, and it's hard to get the full data sheet. Which, along those lines, people ask us, why, why Freescale? Why not uh, somebody like NVIDIA or Qualcomm? Well, this is an example of, this is page one of the reference manual from uh, the, this, the reference manual for the IMX6 CPU that we used. And I'd like to call out in the corner that there's a lot of pages here. Almost 6,000 pages of documentation on this chip that you can get from freescale.com without a password. You don't need an account, you don't need to sign an NDA. It's completely available for you to just download. The only other company that I know of that's reasonably similar to this is TI. They've released some of their reference manuals. But for the most part, you need to sign an NDA in order to even know what this chip is about. Uh, additionally, you can actually buy these chips. This is a picture of digikey.com. Uh, I typed in the IMX6, and you can see there, quantity one, you can buy the CPU by itself for, it's actually about $50 for just the chip itself. So if you didn't trust us to build this, if you wanted to build it yourself, go to, go to DigiKey, take our bill of materials, and you can order everything yourself without being a giant corporation. A lot of things like uh, NVIDIA and Qualcomm uh, and Samsung, they won't even talk to you unless you're going to order at least a million of them. 
People have asked us why are you using an A9? They're old. Why don't you use ARM64 or even an A15? And again, the answer is you can't get them unless you're a giant corporation. I just called out here, this is the list of CPUs that Digikey has again. The best one they have there is the A9. So that's the best commonly available part. We didn't want to build in a part here that you couldn't buy yourself. And finally, this is a Fedora conference. Why Debian? Well, again, tour people who originally were working with to build this, they're all Debian maintainers. So uh, I've actually got a hard drive right here, and I've got a screwdriver. If anyone wants to put Fedora on this sometime later today or over the course of the day. <laughs> now, working with the community. Uh, when you use a laptop like, or when you use a CPU like this, from Freescale, from TI, from Marvel, from any of those companies, they give you what's called a vendor DSP, which is an awful lot like this knockoff Chinese Lego set. Uh, they give you all the parts you need to build this really cool plane. They give you the kernel, they give you the XOR server, they give you a patched version. Mesa, GStreamer, some of them still use DirectFB. Um, the benefits of this art works really great out of the box. It's vendor certified. And if you want to do what most of these companies do and put it in your car or put it in an airplane, it gives you everything you need to build your one application that works really well. Unfortunately, like this cheap Chinese Lego brick, it doesn't really work well when you need to be flexible. If you want to buy more sets and put it together, it probably won't fit because the tolerances aren't very good. Um, they use, tend to use older kernels. Uh, I know they're using a version of Linux that was released about a year and a half ago. The BSP is pretty far out of date. They don't use standard uh, interfaces. They're still using frame buffer as opposed to the kernel mode setting stuff. So they don't support things like hot plug. Uh, and they tend to use, uh, for example, I wanted to get the XOR driver working. And <coughs> I didn't realize until I started looking at the XOR drivers that X changes their ABI pretty quickly, pretty frequently. So, because the vendor BSP was older, I wanted to get it working with the modern version of Linux, and I just wouldn't build at all. I had to go and patch to a driver to get it working with the modern distribution. So we decided to go with the mainline, which is more like just a Lego brick by itself. It's great, you can do anything with it, but you're going to have to use your imagination a lot. And the piece you want might not exist yet, so you might have to build the piece yourself. Uh, the benefits are that it gives you really long-term support. It was only just recently that 286 support was removed from the Linux kernel. Uh, it means that you're better integrated. We support KNS drivers, so if you plug in an HDMI port, it's going to query over uh, the EDIN, and it's going to tell you this is the resolutions of that machine you just plugged in. Um, drawbacks are and there's less robust hardware support. For example, uh, the uh, temperature sensor. There's a temperature sensor on the CPU that tells you how long it is. That wasn't supported until recently. So if you want something and it doesn't exist yet, you need to write it yourself. But Linux did get really early mainline support for this particular CPU. This is a commit from 2011. And the commit was they've added support for the debug port, which meant that you could run a kernel on here and you get a message saying, hey, I can't run the root file system. I don't have a driver for it yet. It's gotten a lot better since then. And we actually haven't used a free scale kernel, a kernel from the vendor since around 2002. We've been running mainline kernels the whole time because we want to have the best possible open source experience. Now, a little bit about how these chips work. Freescale, as a company, doesn't <coughs> build everything themselves. They license intellectual property, they call them IP blocks, from companies like Synopsys. They, when they want a video chip or when they want a PCI Express chip, what they do is they go to Synopsys and they say, or Synopsys or any other company, and they say, what do you have for USB? What do you have for um, video? They also went to Synopsys and said, what do you have for PCI Express? And it turns out that the IP block that is in the IMX6 is the exact same IP block that Samsung uses in their Exynos 5. So when we started working with Mainline, we noticed that there was somebody from Samsung who was in the process of merging PCI Express support upstream for their Exynos. But there were a few bugs left. And so we ended up working with them to not only fix those bugs, but also get mainline support for the MX6. And so by working together, a customer from a completely different chip 
was able to help us, and we were able to help them get PCI Express support for both of us. And now that the driver's actually in there, we're working around other silicon bugs that exist, and we're getting a better product, a better driver for everyone, really. As for the GPU one here, that comes from a company called Vivante. Now, uh, Vivante is, um, they're everywhere. They are in a lot, they're one of the, the major IP graphics vendors available. Um, this particular chip has actually three Vivante cores. There's a 3D core, there's a 2D core, and there's one that just does accelerated vector operations. And the chip only does OpenGL ES, um, which is kind of annoying because Wayland, if you look at Weston, Weston is designed for OpenGL ES, but the 3D core on here uses about 100 times more power than the 2D core. So as a laptop, it'd be really nice to accelerate for the 2D core, and that's something we're gonna have to work on eventually. There is somebody who's working on an XDDX driver, which is gonna get us really nice accelerated X11. That should be available soon. But the problem is the Vivante drivers are all closed source. He uses a proprietary kernel module, he uses a proprietary GL. It changes with every VSP release, so that if you want to recompile a kernel, you need to figure out which version of the drivers go with that. The drivers are built from Prescale, and they're either ARM HF or the ARM Soft Float. So when that switch was happening about two years ago, Prescale was a couple of years behind. Um, it's just it's a little bit of a mess. But fortunately, the community has been working with a project called Etnavid, where they actually know what the instruction set is of the GPU. Um, they've reverse engineered it, and it, it turns out that one driver works on uh, this Marvell chip that has the driver, it's in, it's in the OLPC. Uh, there's a MIPS chip from Ingenic that actually has the same core, which means the same driver works on all of them. You don't have to be reliant on the vendor anymore. The community has stepped up and they built something that is more stable, more flexible, and is able to be upstreamed, unlike the other modules. I think the goal is to have it upstream by 3.17, might be 3.18, we'll see. But it, there's a lot of work being done there. Um, I do want to say, though, that Novena is not the only IMX6 board. There's a few other ones that you can use. Um, we've been sending code back and forth. Uh, there's the, the first one there is called the Qbox I. And the second one, number two, is called the Hummingboard. These are both from a company called um, the Solid Run. Um, they, they make a great product. Um, if you want something but you don't want to spend as much on this one, I recommend giving one of these a shot. Um, the the MX6, because it's so open, it's just the community loves it. So, uh, and then with, with the community help, what did we have to do? Well, the LCD on this is uh, connected using a protocol called Embedded Display Port. Embedded Display Port is just an embedded version of what you connect to your main PC these days. But most embedded chips talk what's called LVDS, Low Voltage Differential Signaling. So we had to do this board. These chips are remarkably difficult to find, um, but we found them on the Chinese grain markets. Um, by using this chip, we're allowed to use new, modern LCDs. The iPad 3 screen can at least an embedded display port, so if you wanted to plug an iPad 3 screen in here. Uh, the one you ended up choosing was 1920 by 1080. Uh, it's an implant switching screen, it's, it's beautiful. Um, we also had to develop a battery board. I mentioned that earlier with all of the, uh, the chips on there. Uh, it's because ARM doesn't really have anything like ACPI. There's no, uh, I want you to shut down now, I want you to turn on what devices are attached, what's their power state. Um, there's nothing like that on ARM. In fact, most chips, uh, sorry? ARM64 would not support like what you said. Yeah, ARM64 does have... Uh, ACPI. Yeah, it's exactly. still very spicy, though. Yeah, in terms of... Uh, even turning the chip off in this case, um, there's no real to find. These chips normally don't turn off. So we delegated it to this battery board that uh, will actually turn the board off, turn it on. Uh, you talk to it over serial. And because the battery board has an ARM chip on it, you actually compile the operating system for the battery board on the main CPU. So if you don't trust the code, you download it, you recompile it, you reflash it, and suddenly you have a new operating system running in your battery board. 
It's got 10 kilobytes of RAM. It's got 64 kilobytes of flash. And it runs a multi-threaded operating system called TDOS. Uh, and the way it's connected is using this serial HDA connector. We'll actually repurpose some of the pins. Um, the way this serial HDA connector is, you can actually power it off of a standard PC power supply. But we repurpose some of the 3.3 volt pins to act as signal serial and high squared C and things like that. Um, we also had to do a few other boards aside from the main board. Um, these are some of the last boards that we did, and you could tell that we didn't really think about them until the last minute because I had to use 3D renderings because we hadn't built them yet. Uh, the one on the left is the on panel button that's got some USB ports on it. Uh, the one in the middle is a Hall effect sensor, so it can detect if the lid is closed. The one on the right, most people don't think of cables as circuit boards, but the one on the right is actually a circuit board. It's a cable that goes from the main board to the embedded display port board. And it has a series of wires that you can see where they're less dense. Those are paired wires that are differential, they're close together. And some of the other wires on there are heavily shielded because they're either power for the backlight or they're USB. Um, we had to design all these and get them built. Normally you don't think about those. We also had to do the factory test, which is a bit different from most tests that you may have done because a factory test is completely different from a continuous integration test. With the CI test, you have to check, did the code that I just check in break? With this, it's more like, did they solder on that part correctly? Um, so you're not really worried about if the CPU is fine. You assume that's fine. You assume that was tested at the factory before they sent it to you. But you want to test, does the Ethernet port work at all? And so the factory test does two things. It tests all the pieces on the board, and it also writes the initial SSD. Uh, we also have to design the plastics. Now, the thing about plastics is most people don't realize how expensive they can be, because everything around us is made of plastic. But it turns out that actually building one of something in plastic is really expensive. The case that I have right here is actually SLA printed, 3D printed. But the final one is going to be injection molded plastic. Um, we called up a company called Plextronics that does a lot of laptops for other companies. And we asked them, could you design a case for us? Could you quote us a case to figure out how much it would cost, a standard laptop case like this? And they came up back to us after about a month, and they said, okay, for all the steel you're going to have to cut, it's going to cost you 250000 US dollars, just in steel alone. Like before you put any plastic into it, anything like that. And we said, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then we went and designed this case, which has significantly fewer pieces than most laptops, and has the benefit that it's actually literally an open laptop. And it ended up costing us about $100,000 in steel. So by completely redesigning the case and being a little bit unorthodox, we both uh, have a cheaper laptop that we can actually afford, which is why we're only asking for $250,000 in the initial campaign. And also has some other benefits, like it solves the economy class problem. So the person in front of you leans back, you can actually keep using the laptop. <laughs> There's a lot of other components in here that you don't really think about. Everything from the, the bezel on the screen to the hard drive mounts to just the springs that you use to pop open the case. You have to source all of these. You have to think about them when you're building an actual product. Uh, and we also had to do sourcing. Now, if you ever are into electronics at all, I really recommend you go to Shenzhen, China. Because you get places like this. These are the markets in Shenzhen, China. I think this is actually the LED market where there are people who sell, uh, it's, it's, I call it the gray market, because what happens is a company like, let's say Cisco, wants to build a router, so they'll go to Foxconn and they'll say, we need 10,000 resistors. We need 10,000 resistors. And they go to the resi resistor manufacturer and they say, great, we have reels of 6,000 resistors. And if you do the math, 6,000 resistors, you're going to need two of those to have enough resistors for your product. So you go, you order two reels, 12,000 resistors total, and you build your product using 10,000 of those resistors. And at the end of this, you have one reel left over that still has 2,000 resistors on it. But you can't actually sell that because it is now a used item. They're perfectly good resistors, but you can't actually sell them. So what happens is it becomes basically worthless like that at that point. And these people at this market and other markets in China will take that and they'll sell it to you at a severe discount. So if you're only building a few hundred machines, like we are, those things are great. 
Because we don't want to buy 6,000 resistors, we just need 1,000. So by going to the markets and getting these, we can save a lot of money and recycle. The other place you get uh, products is a company called Taobao. It's kind of like the eBay of China. Uh, here I am looking at the Wi-Fi card, the ATH9K. This person is selling them. If you want just one of them, they're going to cost you 45, which I think is about 8 US dollars. Uh, but if you need 10,000, he'll sell that to you with a discount. Um, Ship anywhere you want in China. Um, so the two ways, the two major ways of sourcing are either the great market or Taobao, <coughs> or hopefully your factory will also be able to talk to their own vendors and things like that. Um, but without a proper sourcing channel, you're not actually going to be able to build anything. A lot of people get all of their parts off DigiKey, where they'll charge you 10 cents for a resistor, 50 cents for a resistor. But in the market really should cost about a, a tenth of a penny, something like that. Anyway, now that we have this board, what do we do now? Well, dog food. This is my desk at home. Um, unfortunately, uh, the only input that this particular projector has is VGA, and this only has an HDMI output. So otherwise I wouldn't be presenting on here. But normally I have the laptop right here, and then I have a 1920 by 1200 screen that's connected by HDMI. And uh, in this particular picture, you can see at the very bottom there is the battery board that I'm working on right now. Use it as much as possible. Use it as the primary machine. Make sure that when that one thing really annoys you, you fix it. The other thing I have to do is main mining. This is a picture of the audio chip that we use, the ES8328. We've been spending a couple of months now trying to get it upstream. Uh, it's really difficult to merge certain parts of the kernel. The audio subsystem seems particularly annoying, but we're going to work on that. And of course, we need to design the next laptop. This is, you mentioned the 64-bit ARM. This is the X-Gene. It's a server class board, which would not really be that power efficient. Sure, be fast to have it on a laptop. Um, we need to see what chips on the horizon we can actually buy and which ones we'll be able to put in the next laptop once we have this one upstream the main line and finished. And finally, what can you do as a user? Well, the major thing is don't assume the code you're running on is x86. There are three pictures I have of things that are not x86. The one on the left is an IBM mainframe. Runs Linux S390 is definitely not x86. <coughs> the one in the middle, everyone's favorite router, the WRT54G, is a MIPS based system. Runs Linux, runs MIPS. The one on the right there is Google's new super secret uh, motherboard that they announced a couple of months ago. It runs the open power architecture, it's power based. Uh, none of these run x86, all of them run Linux. It would be great if you don't assume that, for example, the byte size this by day or you can address at any arbitrary offset. Along those lines, two rules of optimization. Rule number one, don't. Rule number two, for experts only, don't do it yet. Uh, I've tried to compile a software on here that uh, it gets to a certain point and then it says, oh, MMX, uh, what do I do with this? MMX is a specific optimization that you can do for x86. It doesn't really exist anywhere else. There is the Neon chip that kind of works, but you need to rewrite the code. It makes it really difficult. If you're going to optimize, make sure you keep a fallback path so that other people and other architectures can compile your code. And again, along those lines, high-level languages are great. This is what the server file server for the office looks like now. It replaced a 12-core, 64-bit x86 machine. Uh, we moved from that to this little 4-core ARM Novena with hard, really hard any problems. It was a pretty smooth transition. And as a benefit, it's battery back right now. But because they used uh, high-level code, it was really easy to, to move over. Um, another example, I think this is just because we use Linux, but uh, I had some friends who were working on a, a Heroku uh, Django deployment. And the guy was using a Mac for the initial development. And he said it took them about an hour to get Django set up. And then they went over to their Windows machine, or Windows friends place, and they tried to get it running on there. And that took about a day of hacking to get Django running on, on Windows. But I tried to get it running on here, and it took 15 minutes from the time I did a Git checkout to the time I had it built and running and deployed on Heroku. Because high level language is great. Python is great. It works everywhere. But really well on your Linux. And finally, have fun. 
And we're all here because we like Linux. The people who write the best code are the people who really enjoy doing it and who know as much as they can about their particular area of expertise. Linux really, or Linux really likes C code, he really likes compiling things. He is great at Linux. There are people who work on the audio stack who are just the best people in the world. They're really experts at audio. They know what they're doing because they enjoy it. So enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Do your best. And enjoy whatever area of Linux you can. Thank you. boxes and humming boards and servers um, that people have Raspberry Pi. I think the better solution would be to wait until the 64-bit arms come along. Um, although having said that, I know that Baidu, the Chinese search giant, uses ARM A8s in their servers. They just have a whole bunch of them because they're so power efficient. Um, you know, we don't have any plans for that. How are you keep the widgets cool options inside the box? The um, question is, what are the cooling options? Um, this is my heat sink. Uh, it actually doesn't need to be on most of the time, unless I'm compiling. Uh, this machine doesn't really put out that much heat. Having said that, we haven't been using the 3D core, and once that becomes an issue, we might need to work on that. But for the most part, past the cooling is enough. This machine doesn't put out enough uh, heat to require any sort of fan or anything like that. Battery pack. How, is that sort of, how, how did you source that? The question is, how about the battery pack? In this particular model, the battery pack is, we thought that radio-controlled car batteries are great because radio-controlled car enthusiasts will take the battery out, they'll drive the car around, they'll run it to death, they'll drain the battery completely, and then they'll plug it in their car and they'll charge it up as quickly as possible. An additional benefit is that this battery pack in here cost me 30 US dollars. So it's, that's a great price for a laptop battery pack. Having said that, we got enough money in the crowd campaign that we're actually going to be custom ordering a battery pack that is going to be larger and it's going to fit in the case a lot better. So, and that one will be about double the capacity of this, this very tiny one. So, uh, what do you think needs to happen for open hardware to really become uh, a cost competitive? Because when I look at your price codes on your website, it's quite expensive for what it does. So uh, if you, uh, we're not exactly there yet. Yeah, the question is, uh, what do we have to do to become price competitive in open hardware? Uh, the reason, the big reason why this machine is so expensive is well, the FPGA is a large chunk of it. They're actually two classes of people when I tell them the price of $500 for the board. There's two types of people. One group says, wow, it's really expensive. Why is it so expensive? And then there's another class of people who go, wow, that's cheap. How do you get it so cheap? <laughs> it's, because anyone who's ever tried to buy an FPGA development board knows that they're really expensive. 
a lot of the other parts that use the same chip are much cheaper, which is why I think if you want one and you're not interested in the FPGA, you should go with one of them. But uh, the big reason is volume. These things don't really get cost competitive until you order you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And I don't know if open hardware will ever get to that point. Maybe once we get uh, open fast and things like that, it might come down in price. But hardware is, is expensive and difficult to do. Uh, I don't know if it will ever become cost competitive until uh, money has this whole talk where it talks about Moore's Law slowing down. It's coming to the point where chips aren't going to get any faster. And so at that point, the tabs are going to be money idle and they're going to be able to do things for cheaper. And then we're going to be able to do a more open laptop at that point. It's going to be price competitive because the ones we're competing against won't be getting any faster. Uh, Jeff, you have been in as it is now, is, I mean, the case is clearly tinker oriented. Uh, are you are are you aware of someone working on a more conventional design, like a in a laptop? Uh, the question is, does, because this uh, the, the way the case is, it's more for people who are interested in getting into the hardware themselves and actually tinkering with it. Is there anyone who is working on a more conventional laptop design? There are people on our forums who are talking about it. Um, I think that if you wanted a more traditional laptop design, you look at some of the casing projects that people have done for particularly consoles. Uh, I know Ben Heck is a guy who has done a lot of, for example, casing Xboxes and Playstations. And so if you wanted a more traditional laptop design, I would start looking at those forms and exploring how they did it. Thank you. Are you still taking orders? question is, are we still taking orders? Yes. We have overbuilt by a few, so we do have a few available. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the perks that we were having for as part of the cloud campaign aren't available, yeah. but we are still taking orders. Can FPGA synthesis be performed on the machine itself, or do you need a, a special PC to translate yeah. the variable into FPGA? Can FPGA synthesis be performed on the machine itself? No, it cannot. And that's because all FPGA synthesis software is very close source, very proprietary, and tools come from the vendor. Having said that, there are C++ libraries that can manipulate gates in a synthesized bit stream time because it is literally just a description of the gates. So there are other projects, mostly university projects, that are working to reverse engineer and being able to simulate, synthesize the bit stream itself. But the best you could do on the domain itself using open source tools is simulation. Yes, and can, it, can, can the synthesis software run on a Linux or does it require Windows? There is a 64-bit and 32-bit Linux uh, x86 uh, tool from Xilinx. Yeah. You can run it on Linux. You sometimes get fooled when buying components, say, off the gray market? We sometimes get, uh, I guess counterfeit would be the good, but we sometimes get counterfeit goods when buying off the gray market. You can. That's why you want to check everything when you do the factory test. Uh, as an example, we did uh, for one of our products. We had F an FPGA down, and the code refused to program the FPGA because what it was doing, it was asking it over JTAG, what is your ID? And if it was uh, one particular one, it programmed it with one bit stream, and if it was another one, it programmed it from a different bit stream. And what came back was something completely different. And we looked at it, and we said, wait a minute, that code that came back is for pre-production silica that should never have come outside of Xilinx. <laughs> so, we didn't know where that came from, but we knew that we couldn't actually sell that. The, the trick there is check everything. Check version codes, check uh, vendor codes, make sure that it's authentic. Because if somebody's making counterfeit clones like that, they're going to set a slip up somewhere. Do you have any future plans for building like mobile devices, tablets, smart, open hardware, smartphones, or something related? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so follow up in the gray market, is there a risk that with a small run like this, you're getting, your cost ends up looking artificially low because you're getting these fire sale prices on gray market components, and then if you scale up, you end up paying more? Well, the question is, for these low volumes, is there a, a problem that our, our bill of materials, our bomb, is going to look artificially low because we're going from the gray market? And the answer is not really, because you're going to get the low prices if you scale up, you're going to get in volume, but you get the low prices in addition by going low because you're getting second, uh, more or less second goods. Uh, 
how many people are working on this project? There are how many people working on this project for the design and uh, two. <laughs> I mean, we have a whole factory in China that's actually doing production. Actually, I'm sorry, this factory is in the U.S. We have a whole factory in the U.S. that's doing production. Uh, and there are a countless number of people who are contributing to Linux. But in that terms of actually putting this board together, designing, laying it all out, and then getting the software running, there are two of us, me and Bunny. Okay. Which is any patent issues? Not that I know of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that I want to. One more question. Uh, do you have any certification for like EU imports? Because sometimes that can be problematic if you're trying to purchase something and then you know they will just hold it and almost pretty much confiscate it for like Pebble and some other uh, products like the Ouya as well have issues like this. Yeah, the question is, do we have any, any plans for certification or anything like that? Uh, in general, especially the way this is shipping, it's going to come as a kit. Sometimes it will just be a bare board. And because of that, it's on the onus of the person who's assembling it to certify it. Looks like it's about noon. I think it's about time for lunch. If anybody has any more questions, uh,